Born and brought up in Lynn, Mass, and uh, went to Lynn Classical High School, <clears throat> and uh, played baseball and football there, and um, from there I went to uh, Brewster Academy for a year of prep, and then to the University of New Hampshire. And uh, <clears throat> upon taking the uh, advanced ROTC exam to get into the Army program, I was in the Army ROTC program, mandatorily. Um, to get into the advanced program, taking the test, I flunked it. So I didn't know what I was going to do because that we still had the draft back then. So I said, well, I couldn't do something. So um, my senior year, I wound up uh, going to the Memorial Union building and they had an application for the Navy and an application for the Air Force. And so I took both applications, filled them out, uh, put them in. They said, well, you got to take some tests. I took the test, passed both the tests. They said, do you want to be a Navy pilot or an Air Force pilot? I said, well, either one. I, you know, I said, well, what's the Navy program? Well, the Navy program is a one-year, so that's a cadet program. I said, yeah. And what's the Air Force? Well, that's officer training school, then you go to pilot training. Well, how long is officer training school? It's 90 days. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> I'll take 90 days. So I, uh, I went to, uh, in the process of getting ready to go to uh, pilot training, I got a call from the recruiter, and he said, uh, by the way, you flunked your physical. I said, I flunked my physical. He said, yeah, you've got two cavities. Two cavities? So I went and had them done. My wife's, at that time, girlfriend's uh, cousin was an Air Force dentist had just gotten out of the Air Force. And I <clears throat> had the cavities filled and um, uh, wound up, uh, they said, uh, it's not good enough. Uh, you, uh, will you accept navigator training? He missed the deadline. I said, navigator training? I said, is there any, uh, any difference in pay or anything? He said, no. I said, okay, I'll go to nav school after, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> Officer training school was a separate school. Uh, you had at the time the academy, uh, you had ROTC, or you had officer training school. And the officer training school was at Lackland Air Force Base. And it was a very condensed, compressed course uh, in San Antonio. And you, the, the, the beauty, I guess you could say, for those that needed you know, people would be that you could close and open uh, the OTS program very rapidly, uh, whereas an ROTC cadet, it was a four-year course. Uh, they were at a, uh, usually a state university or a university that had ROTC, but the uh, academy was a very expensive, uh, top quality people, but it took so long to get them through, you had four-year lead time. Whereas if you had a college degree and you passed the tests, you could, you could get into OTS, and OTS was 90 days, and bang, here they are. So for that period of time, the, the orifice was opening up and more and more were going through officer training school, they were expanding it, and they realized they don't need as many, they closed it down. So that, that's the program that I went through okay. uh, back in 1963. So uh, <clears throat> I went to C-130s at Lockhart, Ohio, and uh, that was my first introduction to flying, as you say, flying a line. Um, and, uh, wound up going to uh, France. We had a rotational squadron over there, actually two rotational squadrons. Uh, Lockburn, Ohio, the C-130A model was the first version of the C-130. It didn't have long range, but uh, tactically it was a very good airplane. And uh, so we wound up uh, going over there to fly in support of the Army in Europe. And uh, learned how to fly tactical missions, uh, dropping troops and equipment and things like that. And uh, then uh, was reassigned in uh, uh, it was June of 1966 to CCK Air Base in Taiwan, and uh, upgraded to the E model. A lot much, a lot easier for a navigator to transition from an A model to an E model, simply because of the equipment is fairly similar. And uh, the E model was a much a more advanced airplane than the A for the pilots. It was in the engineers. It was tougher. Well, not tougher. It was a much easier airplane to fly, but they had to learn a lot of different systems. So at any rate, I flew the E over there uh, from 66 to 67, <clears throat> and um, I got my orders to uh, come back to the States, and I was going to be going to Dover, 39th Military Lift Squadron, uh, Dover Air Force Base in the 133. And uh, no sooner was getting ready to leave, and the headlines in the Stars and Stripes magazine was that a C-133 had ditched off Okinawa. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, come to find out, they'd had an issue with their, uh, with their props, uh, had gone into fixed pitch, and uh, as they started en route descent, the engines flamed out and they dead uh, sick into the ocean. No one, no one was killed, fortunately, but it was, the, uh, uh, it was an eye-opener. I said, what was I getting myself into? 
So I came here to Dover in, uh, in 1967 and to get into the 133 uh, program and uh, uh, totally different navigational uh, requirement than the, uh, the C-130 in that most of the missions were long range over water versus C-130, which occasionally would do that, but by and large would be in a theater like Europe or Southeast Asia and you were flying more uh, tactical support missions. But the difference was that uh, overwater navigation was a, a, a different challenge than the tactical missions. And the overwater navigation, especially for the 133, which was a pretty basic airplane, went back to celestial navigation, long range A to navigation over RAN, radar, and pressure pattern, which was just a measure of the difference between the absolute altitude of the airplane uh, and the pressure altitude of the airplane. That determined how you were drifting. So it was a very basic system. But as a navigator, you get into uh, you know, shooting celestial, three-star fixed, sunlines, shooting the moon occasionally. <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> have to explain, have to explain that. that one. We actually shot the moon uh, elevation-wise. And uh, but that, that uh, you know, was a challenge because you didn't have a lot of aids like today where you don't need navigators over water because you've got inertial systems. Uh, you've got satellites. Uh, most of your commercial jets today, they don't have a navigator. Uh, that has come in over time, and it's hard to believe that 1971 was so many years ago, and that the systems have changed so much now that the modern airplanes are, are so so much more up to up to speed with uh, uh, avionics. And I mean, your your uh, uh, Tom Tom, I guess, could probably get you a good position uh, better than I could have back in 1970 71 time frame. So I flew the C-133 uh, until 71 when they were phased out. Uh, the airplane. Uh, was getting uh, pretty tired. Uh, the last airplane to uh, uh, to actually, we lost a, uh, a B model. There were two squadrons here at Dover. There were eight models, and the B model squadron was at Travis Air Force Base. And uh, I believe it was uh, 90529 or 527 was coming from um, Travis Air Force Base, and it had a Chinook a CH-47 helicopter in it. And they were bringing it here to Philadelphia for uh, renovation. And the airplane, with the helicopter in it, disintegrated over Nebraska. And when they pieced the airplane back together, they saw that there was a fatigue crack that had actually just exploded down the side of the airplane, and the nose broke off, and uh, uh, the airplane went in, killed everybody, of course. And, uh, but they saw that there were cracks in these fuselages. So they put belly bands, if you'll notice the airplane out here on the ramp, there's, there's these bands around the airplane, and those were put on there to strengthen that part of the airplane. But the airplane was getting old in that way, and uh, the C-5 was coming on board. Uh, this was now, now in 1971. And uh, so the, the cost of upkeep and, uh, and so on for the 133, and uh, so few of them, they're only built 50 of them, um, and I think there were 30, 35 or 37 left when they finally retired them. Uh, you have one beautiful airplane here, the last production model, the 133 here, uh, 90536. Uh, the last airplane to fly landed at uh, Travis Air Force Base out there in the tra uh, Travis, uh, Travis, California, uh, Victorville, I guess it is. Uh, 20, uh, uh, 61999, and I flew that one out of here. And that landed uh, a summer or so ago, and uh, now it's on static display at Travis Air Force Base. So, um, uh, like I say, the 133 was a good airplane from its uh, standpoint of, of uh, a navigator perspective of going over water, um, having very few aids, a uh, challenge. Uh, we could carry stuff that no other airplane could carry at that time. Uh, we would go over to a place like uh, Tonsonut, and we'd pick up uh, a destroyed, uh, damaged, uh, F4, uh, F105, uh, Jolly Green Giant, we'd bring it back, bring it to the depot. Uh, we would go to Corpus Christi and pick up five Hueys uh, helicopters, brand new ones, and bring them over to uh, Tay Ninh or someplace over there in Da Nang, wherever, and drop them off and pick up five uh, damaged ones and bring them back. So that was what the 133 did back then. We could take, carry fire trucks, <laughs> big things. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, <clears throat> As a navigator, you, you, they were always a little bit behind because uh, we were dealing with, uh, you know, uh, Korean War uh, vintage. We flew, for instance, the twin-engine Convair, the T-29, uh, was a, 
an airplane they call the flying classroom, and, and uh, you had navigator students in there doing very basic navigation. What the basic navigation was is that you would have an air position. That air position was based on the true heading of the airplane plus airspeed. And uh, you apply a little wind to that, wind vector to that, and say, well, we should be right here right now on the map chart. And, uh, and then you try to prove or disprove that with a fix. And the easiest fix would be a radar fix. Radar, and there we are right there. Or some na navigational aid. Um, map reading would be another way. Just look out the window and say, oh, there's Dallas. So that, was, that would be uh, part of the curriculum was pilotage. Uh, and then you say, well, how, how do we learn radar? So that was a course. How do we learn celestial navigation? How do you shoot the stars and shoot the sun, shoot the moon? Um, how do you use uh, other navigate navigational aids, uh, like pressure pattern or uh, Loran, for instance, long-range aided navigation? Well, those are used over water. So all of these courses were taught, but what was happening is the, is the systems were coming out and they were going to, from the Loran A to Loran C to Omega, to all the different navigational systems, and, and so the navigational school was constantly changing. When I left here, Dover, I went to uh, Mather Air Force Base in California to teach at the navigational training school out there, and I was there for six years, and I, I taught radar, taught uh, celestial, pardon me, and, uh, and we were trying to say, well, how do we take this navigator and this particular T-29 flying classroom and put them into the backseat of an F-4? There's very little transitional uh, way to say, yeah, this is, a, now you're flying upside down. You pull on G's, you're, you're doing, you know, going fast versus flying straight up. So the course was constantly being adjusted to, uh, you know, uh, runts and junts and all the rest of these courses. They tried to uh, prepare the navigator or the weapon systems operator for the airplanes that the Air Force had. So we, uh, we had, when we were in California, we, we introduced the T-37, which was the uh, uh, twin engine uh, twin engine and twin uh, crew uh, pilot training airplane, which put a navigator in the right seat, you put a pilot in the left seat, and you show them, you know, aerobatics and, and, uh, and that sort of thing, and you try to get them acclimatized to that type of flying. The, um, The jet, air, the jet age came in when the T-29 was replaced by the 737. And the 737 was called the T-43. And that T-43A model was a 737-200. And that changed the whole complexion of the way you navigated because you were going a lot faster. You are now looking at Mach number versus uh, true airspeed and so on. And, uh, and you were a lot higher. You were flying above weather. And uh, you had relatively instant information that you, that you call. And uh, so the school was being adjusted for that. And uh, so then as the Vietnam War wound down, uh, the need for crew members was starting to you know, go down. So they said, well, we don't need quite so many T-43s. They converted them into uh, uh, VIP airplanes and so on. And, uh, and then they said, well, we want to consolidate all these programs, and so they decided that they would move the training program from Mather Air Force Base, and they moved it to Randolph Air Force Base in Texas. And they had the T-43 flying uh, in that program as part of the curriculum until about a year ago, and they phased out the T-43, and it was kind of interesting. As I was in the uh, lead the force, I guess, so the, the beginning of the T-43 at Mather, and to see it retired, it, it kind of shows you how many years have gone by. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so the, the T-43 is now a, uh, uh, as they get it, it's on a stick someplace uh, as a, you know, a, a, an airplane to look at. Uh, they've taken that whole training school now uh, out of Randolph Air Force Base. Uh, they phased the T-43 out and they've incorporated other smaller airplanes in and moved the whole program to Pensacola. So all navigators for or weapon systems operators for the Air Force and for the Navy and Marine Corps are all trained on it. That's a cool one. Thirty-three had two pilots, two flight engineers. They had two flight engineers, one navigator, and one loadmaster. Uh, occasionally, you'd have a second loadmaster depending on, on the load that you had, uh, and you always had extra crew members giving check rides to the pilots, and the engineers, to the flight the navigators, and so on. Um, so that was kind of the crew complement. And um, some people have said, well, how, how was it a noisy airplane? And, and yes, it was in the back. 
because uh, you had the largest prop uh, built uh, in the free world, I guess, for at that time for the uh, 133's engine, a T-34 turboprop, 17 foot, uh, only two airplanes in the inventory that could carry it, 124 and a 133, and the 133. This was back in the <coughs> 60s and 70s. And uh, so uh, when you get up into the crew compartment of the 133, it was quiet. To me, it was quiet, it was comfortable, you had two reclining chairs, you had two bunks, you had a hot coffee. <laughs> what else could you want? What else could you want? You, you want? I, I think we had a micro, well, it was a, some kind of an, an oven uh, that, we, um, that we would have there. So you could, it was from, from a crew perspective, compared to the C-130, it was really comfortable. 130 was not a comfortable airplane in my view.